Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the old mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your questions. I'm one of your hosts today. My name is John Camby, and joining me, of course, is Mr. Josh McCuga. And I hope that I, I feel like the official adopted son of Canada now. Do I? How do, how do you feel about and that? Yeah, that is a that is a great <laughs> jersey there. I, you, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Number 87. Heck yeah. For uh, for Sid the Kid Crosby. Absolutely. absolutely. I got my old. Uh, uh, Canada Cup jersey, uh, 99 Wayne Gretzky jersey wearing on here. Of course, it's the NHL playoffs, so Josh had the idea, let's wear some hockey jerseys <laughs> for it. I said, absolutely, we can do love that. It, love so it. listen, guys, this is the show. It's a lot more laid back and relaxed than, like, say, Movie Talk is. And really all we do is we take the topics that you guys want us to discuss. Now, how do you get a question to us? It's simple. Make sure you email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We take mailbag questions on Movie Talk Monday through Friday. Mostly we take them here on the weekends as well. But I also take questions from my Twitter, my Facebook, whatever. Wherever you guys like to leave questions, I try to pull some from. So let's get started with the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Murathan Simsek, who writes... The promise is taking place in a time period of alleged Armenian genocide. I am born and raised in Turkey, so I know this is a highly controversial matter here. Turkey denies that this ever happened, while the rest of the world is widely accepting it. A kind of campaign was put in motion to rate the movie 1 out of 10 in order to show them, which I find horrible. If you look at the rating statistics, 49.9% have given the movie a 10 out of 10, and 487 have given it a a 1 out of 10. This all despite the fact that next to nobody has seen the movie, yet right. it has tens and tens and tens of thousands of votes. Now, Josh, this topic actually came up on Movie Talk uh, a couple of days ago mm -hmm. when we were talking about The Promise. And it, The Promise is just one of a long line of films where, for whatever reason, one reason or another, a campaign starts with a group of people to try to downvote a movie on IMDb before they've even seen it yeah. for their own, you know, prejudices and biases. You know, you had a lot of people downvoting the Ghostbusters movie because they made it an all-female cast. You have a lot of people downvoting this movie for this reason and that movie for that reason and The Promise because of the subject matter. Sure. Now, this is stupid. Um, but it, one of the things I said on Movie Talk, and I'll just reemphasize <laughs> it here, this is one of the reasons... No one should ever pay attention to any ratings on IMDb. The IMDb ratings are pointless and useless. Why? Because... Anybody can do it. Anybody can go and vote for whatever reason they want, whether or not they've seen the movie. And you get these extreme examples like The Promise and Ghostbusters and sure. other things like that, sure. But this happens all the time. I remember when The Dark Knight was out, a bunch of people... And Dark Knight's an awesome movie... A bunch of people online started this big campaign because the number one uh, IMDb rated movie was The Godfather. Okay. And a big bunch of people started this campaign. Hey, let's get everybody to go and downvote Godfather. Give one out of ten to Godfather. To as many people Knight. to get it to come down and get everybody to get ten on Dark Knight to get it to go up. And it's like that. That is stupid. That is like really ridiculous and dumb. But it's the same thing. It's the same reason why I don't think anybody should pay attention to IMDb votes because. You never know whether even somebody saw the movie or not. So there's that. I think IMDb should just take that feature off altogether. But it also reminds me about like award shows like the MTV Movie Awards yeah. or something that are fan voted. There should never be fan voted award shows. It's. I mean, it goes to The Voice. It goes to uh, like shows like American Idol back in the day. It, you the, here's the thing and and there are beautiful things that social media does and i think there's there's terrible things that social media does as well and it all kind of goes back to there are a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands who would have the <laughs> yes. the just the gumption or the goal to be like let's all get together and downvote the godfather just to help the dark knight out listen dark knight doesn't need your help on upvotes or downvotes I, I, it's this is like you said so well and so tritely it's stupid it really is and and i agree with you i think there there should be Every every system and every website and every kind of thing wants a rating system. That's yeah. why Twitter put the polls in there. That's why Facebook has polls. Because uh, we all like to vote. We, we like do. to participate. And democracy, is that's what we're based on, right? And the entire world should be run on democracy and voting. But in silly situations like this, to vote uh, in just, just because somebody tells you to vote that way doesn't mean you should do it or that we should put any stock into yeah, it. Yeah, and I'm not saying that fans 
opinions shouldn't count. Of course they should. Absolutely. But we're running into situations here where people who haven't even seen the movie, you don't have to have seen the movie to go in there and vote. And that's ridiculous. And when I say I don't believe in fan voted stuff, no, it's not that fans' opinions of votes shouldn't count, but like take something like, I don't know, the, the Viewer's Choice Awards, or take something like, for instance, the, the MTV Movie Awards. This is based on fan votes, right? Teen Choice, Kids Choice, all those. Yeah. I don't want a movie award being given out based on the opinion of somebody who saw six movies this year. You know, because that's why like an MTV movie award, like Twilight wins a big award. And they can just keep clicking vote, 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 vote. And they can just do it. I don't care. Like somebody who has seen eight movies this year should not be allowed to come in and vote on what is the best movie of the year. So yeah, absolutely fan voices should count. That's why things like, you bring up The Voice, right? Yeah. I'm more sympathetic to things like The Voice because it's on judges. that show. They're seeing, they see the show and they give their opinion. Yes. There's value in that. But when you got something like the IMDB thing where nobody has to see the movie, when you got stuff like the MTV Movie Awards voted on by fans who didn't see any movie, who saw, did not see 75 movies this year, they saw five movies this year, that should not, those should not be considered real things. Some 12 year old in 10 that loves Bella in the Twilight series that can just click and she just sits there on her parents' computer and does it over and over again shouldn't dictate who wins an no. award, a major award, too. Exactly. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question today comes from Emil Johansson, who writes, should Marvel, we get questions like this one quite a bit, should Marvel disconnect their TV characters completely with the movies since they don't really collaborate much behind the scenes and are so tonally different from the movies, kind of like the way CW and the DCEU have done it? That way we can have one ghostwriter on TV and another in the movies. What do you think about that, Josh? Uh, I think, you know, I mean, obviously we talk about this a lot on TV Talk, and I think with the Netflix MCU and... Here's the thing, with the DCEU and CW, they're going to be so differently, it, it, those worlds are going to be so separated, simply because the CW has, I mean, hell, what, Arrow's in season five, yep. Flash is in season three, and we're, we're getting another Flash, so it'd be silly to kind of cross over, although they've said that Barry and, uh, you know, Grant Gustin and um, Ezra Miller can meet somewhere in the Speed Force, right? Okay, fine. Uh, but I think in the MCU is that they mention... They mention the event, which is basically Avengers, right? Uh, they say that in They'd Daredevil. They for you to interpret. Correct, <laughs> correct, right? And they just, uh, an amazing trailer for Cloak and Dagger just came out, which is coming out on Freeform. I did not see that trailer. It's awesome. I heard it's, it's good. Yeah, it looks really, really cool. Uh, unlike a lot of the teen boppery, if you want to call them, uh, uh, shows. <laughs> Uh, that would come out in in the, in this world because you know D, the DCEU for the most part on the CW and you know you like Flash you like uh, uh, Arrow for the most part. <laughs> I used to like Arrow. <laughs> yeah, they have their moments of awesome and they have their moments of gitchy drama love stories, which for better or for worse take place. I personally think in the Marvel M in the Marvel MCU and the TVCU that we don't have the same characters, so the crossover could most definitely happen. And I think on Agents of Shield, it would really benefit. And if you were talking about another ghostwriter, the kid that played Robbie Reyes, I, I forget the actor's name, but he was incredible in the first 8 episodes of this season of, of Agents of Shield. He was an incredible ghostwriter. The plot was awesome, and you know, he's no longer in the series right now, but that was left open interpretation of what happened to him and where he goes. So if he goes in the MCU, I'd be all for it. I think the one thing that Marvel has done really well in, the, in their TV shows, and they're doing really well in the movies, is that the characters are well defined, the actors that play them are great, and their storylines are fantastic. Yeah, I, I go a little bit of the opposite on okay. you. I think the way the CW does it is the way to go, because now this with without connecting the DCU to the television universe, the television shows are free to do whatever they want. Yeah. They, to have their own creativity and tell their own stories with their own characters in whichever way they see fit, and they're not handcuffed to whatever happens to be going on in the moon, movie universe. The same is true of the movie universe. They don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, the showrunner on one of our TV shows did this, now yeah. we have to do, yeah. now we have to abide by that. And I think you see in the Marvel stuff, like for instance, the Netflix stuff is not connected in any way to no. the movies. Uh, like you, you nailed yeah, it. Little... When they say, the event. <laughs> And that's it? I mean, Yo, yo, just, got pictures of the event, got bootlegs of the event, yep. check it out. It's like, um, I'm sorry, if there's some supernatural, like, huge force attacking the city, why, uh, and you're, like, you're in New York, why yeah. does one of the Avengers not show up? Because right. they're keeping these things as separate. And now, ever since Kevin Feige and Perlmutter, uh, Perlmutter's now totally in charge of all the television stuff, Feige's in charge of Marvel mm -hmm. Studios, Feige used to be under Perlmutter. Yeah. But they divorced that. They're no longer work together at all. 
So you have, as, as the question pointed out, you have even less behind the scenes cooperation now than before. Yeah. I think that's what ultimately killed the Inhumans movie. Sure. I think there's a lot of different uh, things that here at play. And so I like the way, I think that's honestly, I think that's one of the main reasons why the Netflix shows are so much better than Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is because while they acknowledge very loosely that that other stuff exists, they never intersect and they never cross over. And you're going to see that in the movies... The Avengers movies, you're not going to see Daredevil, you're not going to see Luke Cage, no. you're not going to see Iron Fist, and you're not going to see any of those movie characters come on the Netflix shows either. And you probably won't see, you know, Punisher obviously getting his own series, which I'm really excited about. That's but awesome. also too, and I think we we've talked about this before, is the more characters you add to this universe, the more difficult it's going to become to keep them all in the same universe because and in keep a the story movie, straight. Where the hell's everybody else? Because he's in New York, right? Yeah. And and well, Iron Man's there, obviously. Right. Well, yeah, we're going to get Iron Man. We saw that, but. But where is, you know, where is all the people that he was with in Civil War? Where is, is Ant-Man doing it? So they, they have their cities, they have their world, but they also, I think, and, and the great thing here too is, like you said, you are not handcuffed to doing certain things within certain guidelines of the MCU or TBU. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes from Paul Gilmore who writes, Hey, Collider crew. If you could screen just two Dustin Hoffman movies... I thought you said scream. I was like, no. scream <laughs> Dustin Hoffman movies. Sorry, guys. If you could screen just two Dustin Hoffman movies and you couldn't screen The Graduate, which other two movies would you show? Now, that's that's a little bit of an easy question for me because The Graduate wouldn't have been in my top two anyway. Yeah. Because The Graduate is great. Here's the two I would do for sure. One would be... Uh, this one was close. But one would be Rain Man. I, I just think it's one of Dustin yeah. Hoffman's greatest performances. Yeah. He's so good in that. But easily by a mile, my favorite Dustin Hoffman movie of all time is Tootsie. <laughs> Tootsie is freaking unbelievable. It's the last pure comedy I remember getting nominated for Best Picture, too. It. Uh, I remember something like, you got to watch Tootsie, you got to watch Tootsie. And I think based solely on the cover of Tootsie, I was like, I'm not going to watch this movie. It's probably a musical. And somebody's <laughs> like, dude, it's not a musical. It's I was like, awesome. Oh. It's so I good. I watched Tootsie. You can't pick a... I, I mean, to me, that's Dustin Hoffman's best performance. And he does it so well. It's almost like a... You know, Mrs. Doubtfire, you forget that it's Robin Williams. You forget yes. that, and you forget when he's doing Tootsie that it's Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, It's totally. absolutely fantastic. For me, I would say Tootsie, and I would say... Uh, Kramer versus Kramer? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, look, it's Hoffman. He's got yeah. tons of great yeah. ones. I mean, so even he's even good in Meet the Fockers. I don't care what anybody says about that movie. It's not the best movie. Dustin Hoffman's fantastic. Well, I mean, look, you can have not so great movies and have great performances yeah. in them. And yeah. Hoffman, Hoffman's is great and everything. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the. Oh, actually, one more thing. Have you seen that latest show that Hoffman's been in? The, about the Italian aristocrat uh, family where they're bankers. Oh, the Medici's. The, the Medici's, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's very good. I actually liked it a it's lot. It's Rob Stark. It ended weird. It did. It ended weird, but I, I'm, I'll, I'll keep an open mind and see where they go. See Netflix see buried that. They did. They buried I it. accidentally came across yeah. that show. I was like, "What?" Like, I never even heard of it. And I watched it like this is actually pretty good. I know, and it, I mean, and again, it has Rob Stark, and and it. Listen, I I love that part of Italian history, and Shakespeare wrote a lot of plays on that part of yes. Italian history. So there is a a. I, that, that show is very, very underrated, just like Rome was on HBO. Yeah. Uh, and again, Netflix Netflix buries weird shows, and they promote weird shows. It's weird how they do their front page. Yeah, I don't Medici's know. got buried. Yeah. It's weird. Okay, the next question comes from Mano Charles J. Kumar, who writes, When Batman vs. Superman was released, I felt alone and mocked for voicing that I love Batman vs. Superman, and show you should. so you should. I uh, love it. Um, a year has passed now. Though I am still in the minority, more and more people are recognizing that it was not a bad movie. I believe 10 years from now, the film will be considered a misunderstood classic. And Razzies are only going to help my case. What do you guys think? Nope. <laughs> nope. Look, hey, I'm one of the guys who likes Batman versus you're, Superman. You're the apologist. I'm the apologist yes. for Batman versus Superman. Okay, I'm the one who sticks up for Batman versus Superman. As a matter of fact, I put out a video. Search for this. I actually put out a little video essay on defending the Martha scene. Okay. Because I, I actually think the Martha scene makes sense. Even though go we all, on. <laughs> even though we all laugh at it. And all, I, I, I won't go into it all right now, but go okay. and check out that video. So defending the Martha scene is one I, I put out. I am one of the, the Batman v Superman defenders. Okay. And, and absolutely. See, here's the thing. You should never be mocked or ridiculed for a movie that you like. I, there's no movies... Uh, that are that I trash more than the prequels, than the Star Wars prequels, <laughs> right? But I will always say, 
That's only how I feel about them. If you like the prequels, that's awesome. You should celebrate that you like it, and I celebrate that you like it. For me, they're garbage. I mean, that's fine. It's, they're still Star Wars movies. Yeah, at but the that end doesn't mean day. you shouldn't like them. You should celebrate, them. and you should never make somebody belittle anybody for liking a movie that they like, uh, because that's kind of suggesting that you are the arbiter of what is good and what isn't, and that just makes you an ass. Um, <laughs> so I mean, yeah. So you should fine. But look, as somebody who has defended Batman vs Superman and enjoys the film for what it is. I also recognize why a lot of people don't like it. They're, they're, look, it's the movie's not as good as it could have been, and the movie's not as good as it should have been. Uh, it does have its flaws and its weaknesses and all that kind of stuff. So just as it would be wrong, as, and it is wrong for anybody to mock you because you like the movie, I think it's equally as wrong for you to say, oh, those people are just dumb for not liking it, and eventually they'll come around. No, I think they have some really rational reasons for not liking the film, and I, I just don't think this is going to be one of those... You're not gonna, people are not going to be talking about the great Batman versus... At least on mass, how great Batman versus... It's one of the all-time classics. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to always be one of those... Like like Man of Steel, which I think is I was a masterpiece. Just say, it's just always going to be one of those divisive films. I think that more people are well, are still trying to fight for Man of Steel mm. than they are trying to win the argument for a, of Batman v Superman. And I, and Batman v Superman to me, there were parts that I really liked, but my problem with the movie that it, it just felt so segmented and disjointed. It didn't it did. feel yeah. like a very fluid movie to me. Man of Steel, I've watched. The first time I watched it, I walked out kind of bitter because I, I didn't really like it. The second time I watched it, I was like, okay, I can see. Third time, I, I started to come around. So it, it's honestly like uh, going to a sushi restaurant. If you've never had sushi before, you keep <laughs> you keep eating. You're like, I like this. Oh, shrimp tempura. That's not bad. But Batman v Superman, listen, as long as that Martha scene, I know you defend it. As long as that Martha scene exists, that movie will be a punchline. Uh, the entire crux of the movie is based on the fact that their mother's name, my mom's name is Debbie. I have other friends named Debbie. That doesn't mean I have to be their best friend and in the middle of a fight and be like, ah, oh, our moms have the same name. I'm done. Like it just, it, it, as long as that, and, and as long as, as uh, Jesse Eisenberg's performance of Lex Luthor exists, I cannot watch that movie. See, I just, and, and I, I get it. You know what? Oddly enough, the Jesse Eisenberg performance kind of worked for me. Okay. Uh, but I can see why I, I totally understand. And I, I concede why a lot of people didn't like. So no, I don't think it's going to 10 years from now be considered a classic. Somewhere on a mountain, Gene Hackman in his in his uh, retirement cave, his palace is like, I can't believe they made him Lex Luthor. <laughs> but that's the, besides the point. All right, the next question comes from Zach Burlke, who writes, what is a better chance of happening? Andrew Garfield returning as Spider-Man <laughs> in, in the new Sony Venomverse or Miles Morales is Spider-Man in that live-action Venomverse. Oh, I would go Miles Morales. A one hundred percent. Yes, I don't think, and I don't. One, I don't think they're going to bring Andrew Garfield back. And two, why would he come back? He is. A, he's a fantastic actor that has a great future ahead of him. I could see that dude winning at least one Oscar. Uh, he, he's a fantastic actor. I think that the Spider-Man backlash after Amazing Spider-Man Two was so much so he's like, why am I doing this to myself? I don't have to do this to myself. I'm booking other roles that are way more meaty and things that I want to do, and. I don't need to put up with the amount of hate and and guile that I got from Amazing Spider-Man too. I, well, uh, to answer the question, but why would he? Yeah, he loves Spider-Man. Okay. okay. And if you haven't seen it, go back when they first after they just shortly after they first announced that he was the new Spider-Man uh, for the first uh, Amazing Spider-Man movie. He showed up at Comic Con mm -hmm. in a Spider-Man mask and then took it off and gave this basically a speech in Hall H about what Spider-Man means Were to you him. There? I wasn't there. Okay. I, I was at Comic-Con. I was not in Hall H. It. So I watched, it's on YouTube. You can see it. And it is one, it's almost tear-jerking. Like, yeah. it is one of the most moving speeches about a, an actor talking about a comic book character. He loves that character. Absolutely. But no, they're not going to bring him back. He's yeah. not going to come back. The dude's 33 years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not looking for a 33-year-old, um, you know, Maybe as a mentor. at this point. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see that happening. I do, however, think nobody has said anything. Not uh, This is all speculation, okay? I personally really do think there is a window of possibility here that should Sony move forward with the standalone universe like it looks they are, 
that Miles that becomes their opportunity to bring Miles Morales in, and Miles Morales becomes the Spider Man of that universe. I think it's possible. I'm not willing to put money on it, but I do think it's possible. Andrew Garfield coming back, I don't think is possible. I think with with the arc, if they take Peter Parker and they, and they trend him into Miles Morales, it's an amazingly smart move by by Marvel. Okay, so the next question today comes to us from Will Swarstrom, who writes. What non-superhero movie are you most looking forward to this summer? So the summer of 2017. What's standing out to you? So we got things like The Begah, we got Baywatch, we got King Arthur, uh, we've got Snatch, we got Guardians of the Galaxy, we got... Guardians of the Galaxy is a superhero movie though, right? Guardians of the Galaxy is a superhero movie, yeah, yeah. So which one is standing out to you the most? My, I feel like I'm I'm so I'm like week to week as far as summer movies go, but um, after watching this this trailer for Beguiled, I'm not really looking that forward to it. It kind of looks a little off. I, yeah, that, that didn't work for me. Didn't work for me. But I tell you what, Baywatch is is intriguing to me simply because I don't know what that movie's going to be like. And the I Rock, think it looks funny. And The Rock to me is like he just keeps knocking out of the ballpark. Uh, ballers excluded, I guess, since I, I just never really bought into that show. But The Rock and in this Baywatch thing, starting a new franchise of Baywatch, it looks so silly and so fun that, yeah, it looks like the perfect summer movie. Uh, for me, I'm going to go. I, I, I do agree with you. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to Baywatch. The other one, I'm the one I am most looking forward to that's a non comic property is probably Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Yeah. That that's the one that I'm super intrigued about. The era of it, the subject matter of it, the fact that Christopher Nolan is directing it. Uh, I think that's the one I'm looking forward to the most. Every few years a movie like a Dunkirk will come out and remind us about just how brutally bad World War II was on this entire world. Oh yeah. War right? I love it when movies just remind us war sucks. It's awful. There's nothing glorious about war. And reading I my dad made me read a book about Dunkirk when I was a kid because my dad loves World War World War II history so much. And the actual battle and the Dunkirk and the massacre at Dunkirk is just it's it's i mean the fact that nolan is doing this movie thank you for bringing it to uh, our attention because not enough people know about dunkirk all right let's move on to the next question the next question today comes to us from dalton ham who writes is power rangers a dead movie franchise now, at this point we talked about it before we were talking about monies the yep. last time we got to monies talk uh, talked about mailbag i don't think it's dead i, I think uh, I think they'll give it another movie. I, I would, I would, I would be shocked if they didn't make a trilogy. Simply, but maybe scale back on some things. I don't know. It didn't do. It didn't do what they wanted it to do, and that's for sure. But I don't think it's dead. I don't think by any means it's dead. They lock these people in, and I think they. I think they want. I think they want word of mouth to take this thing to the next level. But if the second one bombs, I think it's probably dead. I. I. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Look, so far. This first Power Rangers movie has lost the studio a lot of money yeah. right now. Now, there are still a few more foreign markets for it to open in. But as of right now, the movie's made altogether worldwide about $120 million. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. It's not good. This movie needs to cross, well, it's a $100 million production budget, about $40 million in marketing with one-third going back. You're probably looking at this movie needing to make two hundred and forty, million, maybe $220 yeah. million worldwide to break even. If they can't get the first movie to at least break even, they're not going to do it. Even with sales gonna... and distribution on the back end to streaming services, and it, still not. No, no. Look, this. I said this movie was a bad idea. I did not think this was something that could be commercially successful, yeah. and I couldn't. I didn't think it would be qualitatively good. I I was shocked. I liked the movie. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it, even though I said for two years, I there's no way anybody's going to like this movie, <laughs> but I got to call it like I see it. I enjoyed the film. I thought it was a really neat, clever take on it. But this whole notion, I remember having this debate with some people, and you know who you are, who say <laughs> Power Rangers Look is going to make $250 million domestically. And I said, no, That's no, it's not. That's a lot not. of money domestic. Uh, it hasn't even cracked 100 and won't crack 100. It's around 81, which isn't a bad mm -hmm. little sum of money, but it is a bad little sum of money when your production budget that alone is $100 million. Dollars. So I, I see where you're coming from, but unless... In, in the few markets that it still has to open, unless it does gangbusters business, this I think this might be the last Power Rangers movie we see for a while. For a while. I think, you know, when you, you hear the word of mouth, and it was good, 
right? The word of mouth wasn't terrible. Everybody I talked to, maybe at least in our movie circle, was like, it was fun. It was an entertaining movie. It was what it was. But if you're a studio, you don't want people going around going, like, it wasn't bad, right? Yeah. You you want people going, you got to go see this. You want to see this, especially when you're spending that much money on rebooting slash reimagining a franchise and hoping, hoping for it to be a franchise. Because, I mean, how many different TV series are there? There's international. There's, there's domestic. I mean, there's cartoons. There's everything. So... Uh, they they have enough money in the Power Rangers with with merchandise and everything that they're not exactly jonesing to <laughs> make another one as far as the, as far as like you know Saban goes and all that stuff. What I'm saying is the studio when they put it out, they're like, oh man, this is going to be another franchise. This is going to be incredible. The way the it made money and the way it kind of like worked word word of mouth. I think the studio had it up front and now it's somewhere in the back to the middle of the line. Yeah. All right, let's move on. The next question comes to us from Brian Bernardi, who writes. Would you rather see a feature film based on the 80s classic television series Airwolf or a live action adaptation of the animated show Silverhawks? Hey, both. That's that's great. Absolutely Airwolf. I would love to see. What was his name? Uh, Man, Jan Michael Vincent. Jan Michael Vincent. Jan Michael Vincent. Man, Airwolf. I haven't and heard. And who was the guy? The, the great Oscar winning actor who was a. Uh, um, Alex Cord? No, who was the, like his sidekick guy in, in the show. The old guy. Um, oh, Ernest Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine. Thank yeah, you yeah. very much. Yep. And, the, and the movie. The <laughs> it might be my all-time favorite television theme music. The thing about that, it was three little, seasons. It was a little bit of a ripoff. Sure. Of the movie Blue Thunder. Okay. Uh, with the whole like invincible helicopter motif, but I loved the show. The idea that some guy steals a prototype piece of advanced weaponry from the military and is hiding it in a cave somewhere, and he busts it out when he needs to save yep. the day. Yeah, I love it. So for me, one hundred percent, it would be Airwolf. What Air- about you? Airwolf is a is a, a classic that you know is a little before my time. I mean, eighty four. I was only two. So if you brought that back and you modernize it a little bit. It's that's you you see MacGyver was too iconic for it to make sense and work and also it was terrible. But Airwolf you could you could do some awesome stuff with Airwolf cuz it had I mean dude 84 you're in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah. You you have all that stuff even if you did like a throwback now and how they used Airwolf. Oh man, yeah, that's that's a great idea. I would be down for that. Yeah. All right. Next question comes from Andy Shen who asks a little asks a little bit of a behind the scenes question. Where are box office predictions for Movie Talk? That was my favorite segment on Fridays. Um, yeah, we used to do box office predictions because we it was sponsored by AMC. Our sponsorship deal with AMC has ended at this point. Obviously, we've got a real long, rich history with AMC mm-hmm. here. We started this whole thing with AMC. Um, but, you know, that deal ex- expired, and really that was the main reason we were doing the predictions we always felt it was awkward the fact that we would do ma- box office predictions on friday but none of the people on friday show would be on monday show yeah. to actually talk about results and yeah. things like that or to keep any kind of score and so we just decided you know what, there's kind of no point in doing it so we just let it go maybe we'll bring it back sometime but right now we just can't and didn't keeping feel a, a running purpose. tally to even make the competition work yeah. became a little bit diluted and uh we had i think there was a lot of trouble with everybody what did you pick how much did you pick what did you say because you know once we do the show we kind of go on to yep. a billion other things so it's tough oh uh, yeah all right next question comes from jim bellamare who writes do you think there will ever be a remake of back to the future uh, now remember there are two yes. separate questions here question one should there ever be a remake of back to the future the, the but the question you are asking is could there ever be a sequel? These are two radically different questions. He said could in there? Yeah. Could there ever be a sequel? The answer to that is absolutely definitively yes. And I do think there will be a remake of Back to the Future. I do not think it will be this year. I do not think it will be five years from now. But once we start getting into like closer like 2025, 2030, stuff like that, it becomes a classic movie status that could benefit from updated yeah. uh, techniques and technologies. There would be. Now, whether there should be goes back to the old debate about whether you should have remakes or not. And you know where I stand on that. But yes, I do think at some point, not anytime soon, but I do think there will be a remake of Back to the Future. And should they, for me, 
I say no because I love that franchise so much. Even even the third one that not a lot of people love. Um, I know that's like the device of Godfather three kind of thing. You know, Back to the Future three sucked. I'm not trying to compare Back to the but Future. Godfather, Godfather three was nominated for Best Picture. I, exactly. I'm. <laughs> I, I mean, listen again. I'm not. I'm not comparing either movie. What I'm saying is that. Uh, I don't think there should be. Absolutely, there could be. And this might sound really morbid, but I don't think they're going to do a Back to the Future remake while Michael J. Fox is still alive. I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Unless he became the new Doc. Yeah. No, I could. I would get along with I would get behind that. that. I would absolutely. totally get behind that. Yes. All right. The next question comes from James Duffy, who writes, do you think that Grand Admiral Thrawn will show up in episode eight? Eight. Really interesting. I'm, I'm about halfway through reading the new Thrawn novel right now. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying it. I, I think it's quite good. But no, I love this character. I have loved this character ever since back in the non-canon books of the Heir to the Empire series, mm -hmm. the Thrawn trilogy as it's called. No, I do not think he's going to show up in episode eight. I think he's probably going to meet his end in, in, end in Rebel season four. Uh, it's just too much time in the future. So no, I do not think we're going to see Thrawn in episode eight. I'm with you. <laughs> All right. And our Talking to the wrong guy on that one. Final <laughs> question today. Frank Tupling writes, your thoughts on Sam Witwer's late blowout at Celebration. For those of you who don't know, we had a movie trivia, yeah. all Star Wars movie trivia showdown at Celebration. Heading into it, the big favorite was Darth Maul himself, mm -hmm. Sam Witwer. Um, and Sam, by the way, we did a lot of shit talking. Sam yeah. is a awesome wonderful guy and an awesome beast of a competitor and an awesome shit talker if you ask me oh and yeah, he's great he, at that he's he great can, at he that can talk some shit um and so we went into that and he was breezing through man and he was mm -hmm. running up a perfect score he was like two or three points ahead of me uh at one point and then we got into the third round and he hit one question that that confused him mm -hmm. um and he gave an answer that if the question was different would have been the right answer, but he got it wrong. But that was fine because he was still in a position to tie the game with the final question, and he froze. Now, here's the thing. We – every – it happened to Ken in yeah. that in that thing when he accidentally thought Qui Gon told Obi Wan they should be mindful of the future. No, that was Yoda who said. It. He just said, he knew the answer. He just had a momentary brain freeze. I've had it. Every competitor, you've been in a lot of schmodown. Yeah. It happens to everyone. Even if you know the answer, those momentary brain freezes happen, especially once you get about forty five minutes into the schmodown competition. We've been answering question after question after question. I called. Uh, you lost that love and feeling. Unchained melody. So uh, you know <laughs> it, it, we've been there. And so what happened to Sam is what happens to all of us. Yep. He had his momentary brain freeze for a second. Of course he knew that that guy was Captain Eat. Of course yep. he knows that. But he had that momentary brain freeze. We all have it, and it just happened to happen to him at the wrong moment. And boom, boom. what eventually turned out was boom. exactly what I said. I would win. <laughs> uh, or at least at least I beat Sam. Uh, and then, and then uh, Kenny and I went to a sudden death, and, and Ken pulled it out in sudden death overtime. And if but, you haven't watched it, listen... I, sometimes panel footage from cons doesn't turn out that great because the cameras are in weird places. Right, right, right. right. The, the, the audio is tough. That was awesome. Yeah, it, it awesome. really turned out great. I've, I have a lot of fun watching it. Uh, if you have not seen it, go back and watch it. If you want to get a little sample size of how exciting and fun the Schmodown can be and how the audience was so great. I mean, I was stunned. They gave us a 600-seat um, room. And we all thought, oh, my gosh, well, if we can get, like, 300 people in here, that would be great. Yeah. If we can just get 300 people. Three hours before the event started, they had to shut down the line. Crazy. They say anywhere between fifteen to 1,700 people tried to get in line to come in that thing. So, so it cool. packed so the room cool. out. So thank you to you guys who came. But do not think for a second that Sam Whitwer is anything less than he's at home to a galactic his knife threat. And his I knife mean, is Star Wars he's brain. a boss. Okay, yes. and, and I tremble at the notion that he will be back, and I'll have to probably compete against him again at some point. And uh, may, who knows? Maybe a Comic Con. Maybe Star a, Wars. No Star Wars. The guy scares the crap out of me. So, oh, he, uh, but <laughs> such a great sweetheart human being. of a such dude. A, such a great <laughs> human being. All right, guys, that'll do it for this install in the mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget subscribe to this YouTube channel, keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news. Join us for a movie talk. Monday through Friday, of course, TV talk every week as well. Lots of other programming we got. And make sure you send in your questions to us. 
to collider video at gmail.com. I want to thank Mr. Josh McCuga in thank that you, wonderful Sydney Crosby jersey. Josh, where can people find you online? Uh, you guys can find me at Josh McCuga on Twitter and Instagram. Every Monday we do Collider TV Talk, and May 1st through May 5th, we're going to do a, a trial run of TV Talk every day, live at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. So tune in for that, and you guys can see the Josh McCuga show on YouTube. And you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Until tomorrow. Bye-bye.